Well, good evening and a warm welcome to everybody this evening. Warm in here, not so much outside, but it's warm in here. And we're glad you're here with us. Thank you for those that are visiting with us. We appreciate you taking your time to be with us this evening. I'd like to ask you to turn, please, in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 5 of Nehemiah 3 down to verse 12. And we're going to consider, continue this journey around the walls as we witness different ones who contribute to the building of the walls and to the setting up of the gates. And so we'll begin reading in verse 5. It says this, the next un- And next unto them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Passia, and Meshulam, the son of Besodia. They laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. The next unto them repaired Melatiah, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Meronathite, the men of Gibeon, and of Mispah, unto the throne of the governor on this side the river. Next unto him repaired Uziel, the son of Hariah, of the goldsmiths. Next unto him also repaired Hananiah, the son of one of the apothecaries. And they fortified Jerusalem unto the broad wall. And next unto them repaired Rephiah, the son of Hur, the ruler of half part of Jerusalem. And next unto them repaired Jediah, the son of Harumph, even over against his house. And next unto him repaired Hattush, the son of Hashabniah, uh, Malchijah, the son of Harim, and Hashab, the son of uh, Pehath Moab, repaired the other piece and the tower of the furnaces. And next unto him repaired Shalom, the son of Ahaloshesh, the ruler of half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. And I want to just say this, I can't guarantee the accuracy of the pronunciation of any of those names. Uh, uh, It was the best attempt I could make. They may be accurate, they may not be. But I wanted to just focus a little bit on uh, this uh, picture of building the walls a little bit and the people that were involved. And we mentioned last night uh, that the first piece of discouragement that we had come across was in verse 5, where it says, next unto them that... The Kohites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. And what is interesting, that despite the nobles' failure, it didn't discourage the Tekoites from building. And and that's just an interesting point, that sometimes it it may be possible to be in an assembly uh, where those that are in a leadership role, the shepherds, the elders, may not be functioning the, the way they ought to be. What I would say, more passive shepherds. Uh, they've got a title, but the work is another story. They don't do much work. And yet what is amazing is that there are people in those assemblies that despite the discouragement of the lack of an example from the oversight, still roll their sleeves up and get on with the work of their Lord. And that's always a great encouragement, isn't it? And there are many assemblies that's just kept going by people who are committed to the truth of the assembly and are just going to keep working, whether they get encouragement or not, or whether they have good examples or not. They're just going to be faithful. By the way, aren't we thankful for faithful souls? who just are going to do the right thing because they're convinced it's the right thing, even despite encouragement. What's amazing about the Tekoites, if you look down in verse 27, you'll notice that not only did they do their part, but it says in verse 27, after them, the Tekoites repaired another piece over against the great tower that lieth out even unto the wall of Ophel. Isn't that remarkable? That... Although their nobles set such a bad example, they said, well, we're going to do our part. And even when they'd done their part, they said, actually, we'd like to do another part. Don't you love enthusiastic saints that do what's required of them and then say, well, I'd like to go the second mile. (laughs) Is there anything else I can do? And they do that too. And so the Tekoites, 
even though the nobles are forever uh, written in Scripture uh, as those that fail to do their part, those that were supposed to be kind of looking to them for example, they have set us an example that is absolutely marvelous. And we said last night, in every, in, in every work, there are workers and shirkers. And in every warfare, there are soldiers and there are deserters. Those that neglect to do their duty and others that gladly do their duty. And we have to ask ourselves, where do I stand in this picture? Am I somebody who is a worker for God in the context of my local assembly, just doing whatever needs to be done to build up the testimony? Or or am I somebody who is, well, neglecting the duty that the Lord has given to me? And so we might say this, don't discourage your brethren. Don't have the shame of being a poor example or a shirker of your responsibility. So that's the, uh, we're starting up on kind of the north wall where the sheep gate is. That's where we began. We mentioned in verse 1, Eliashib, the high priest. By the way, I meant to mention last night, but Eliashib, the name Eliashib means God will restore. How appropriate that the first person who's involved in building the wall, his name is God will restore. Isn't that incredible? Because isn't that what this all is about? It's a restoration project, right? It, the walls had been knocked down. The, the gates were burned. And this is a work of restoration. And right at the beginning, the Lord has a man called Eliashib. And his name means the Lord will restore. By the way, isn't it a wonderful thing that God is in the restoration business? Oh, I'm so thankful that he restores. Uh, We're going to see a great example of somebody who's restored before we get to the end of this chapter. And and he's there, I think, as as a perpetual example for us of the fact that God is in the business of restoring people. And uh, it's a wonderful thing when you see somebody. I saw somebody recently. They'd been away from the Lord 22 years. And they came back. And I talked to them. Boy, I'll tell you, they just, they said there was never a day in those 22 years when they didn't think about the things of God. And now they're back. They are so joyful. It's absolutely wonderful to be around them. They're just just loving everything all over again in a fresh way. Oh, I'm so thankful that God restores. And we can continue to pray for people to be restored to the Lord. It's a good thing. Yeah, so we move on to the West Wall. And uh, the, verses, the verses I read, just interesting that in verse 8, you find people in this project you might not expect to see. And so we notice here, for instance, that there's uh, verse 8, Next unto him repaired Uziel, the son of Hariah, of the goldsmiths. I, I don't really know a whole lot about goldsmiths other than I've seen kind of uh, pictures of jewelers, you know, and they're, they're used to fine work, right? Goldsmiths. You see them with, you know, they've got their glasses on, and then they've got this other extra glass that they, and, and it's very fine, delicate work goldsmiths are involved with. And here they are, and they're moving rubble, and they're lifting boulders, and they're This is not what they're used to. Can you imagine at the end of a day on the building site, their backs, they're not used to this. I'm sure they were absolutely exhausted. And then it goes on and also talks about next to him also, what what a combination uh, of the goldsmiths. And then it says, uh, uh, also repaired Hananiah, the son of one of the apothecaries. Well, apothecaries, uh, we we might think of somebody like a pharmacist. Uh, but uh, also apothecaries were also known for, as perfumers. They made scents. They made perfumes. And again, we're just thinking, generally speaking, people who were involved in what we would call delicate work and now working together in this project, which is so different to what they're used to. You might say they're a little bit out of their comfort zone. This is not their normal comfort zone. But here they are working together to rebuild the testimony, to roll away the reproach, and they're doing things that are outside their comfort zone. I I found so often if we really want to have effective ministry, sometimes we've got to go outside our comfort zone. 
I think for many of us, talking to complete strangers about their souls is outside our comfort zone, unless you happen to be gifted as an evangelist, and then it's like breathing. But for most of us, it's not like that, and it is outside our comfort zone. And yet, how are people going to hear without a preacher? And maybe there's no evangelist around, so Paul says, do the work of an evangelist. Whether you're gifted or not, do the work. And so sometimes we've got to go outside our comfort zone, do things that are not what we might uh, feel comfortable with in order to build up the testimony for the Lord. And certainly that's what we're seeing here. Uh, Rebuilding the wall, blistered hands, aching muscles. And yet we would say that in assembly testimony, there's never any gain without pain. It's work. The Lord's work is work. And that means effort. That means energy expended. Uh, And so we see these people uh, doing these marvelous things. Notice as well, um, unlike the nobles of Tekoa, look in verse 9. It says, Next unto them repaired Raphael, the son of Hur, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. Now, he's, he's not a noble, he's not nobility, but actually he's a ruler of half the city. Obviously, somebody high up in civic life in the city rules half the city. And yet, he didn't say, well, that's beneath me. I pay people to do that kind of thing. No, nope. he finds his place on the wall, building with everybody else. How marvelous that is. Down in verse 12, next to him repaired Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. Can you imagine having your daughters, I don't know how that would affect their manicured fingernails, working on moving rubble and and all of this, but they're there, right? And, And by the way, isn't it wonderful to have families working together for the cause of Christ. There's nothing more delightful than that. And so here's the daughters working too. And by the way, as again, as we think of assembly work, it's interesting how the Apostle Paul, uh, let's look at Philippians, just keep your finger there in Nehemiah, but let's go to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. And I want just to read a, a, just a simple but delightful verse where Paul acknowledges the labor of sisters And again, I don't believe in any inappropriate way going outside of the scriptural uh, uh, kind of restrictions that are there. I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. Help those women which labored with me in the gospel. And you know, I found that some of the greatest soul winners that I know are sisters. You know how I know that? That's how I got saved. It was a woman that shared the gospel with me in the workplace. And that's how I got saved. And that woman eventually became my wife, which was I'm very thankful for. And when we, I started open air evangelism in England, started preaching in the open air, my wife would stand in front of me and be my audience. And there was another brother who used to preach to me, and his wife used to stand there. And they'd be listening, and we'd be preaching, and then as soon as we'd finished, if there was a crowd gathered around them, they would move in with their gospel tracts and uh, just look at them and, and say, did you, you know, what, think about what you heard, any thoughts, and share the gospel with them. We're so thankful for the ministry of sisters. Within the biblical framework, within the biblical grounds, but there's so much, to, uh, we often talk about this, that, Uh, One of the things the enemy likes to do is point out to sisters what they can't do. And you know where he got that idea from? He used it in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? Do you remember that? Instead of pointing out all the trees that Eve could eat from freely every single day she wanted, what he focused on is the one tree she couldn't eat. And that's how the enemy likes to work, isn't it? Show you, oh, you're missing out, you see. You should be preaching. You should be doing this. And yet there's so much that can be done in how how we need to not let the enemy somehow undermine us from the privileges that he's given us to do. And so certainly we see that here 
that these uh, sisters are engaged in. Romans 16 is a, is a marvelous catalog of the impact of godly sisters that Paul recognized in the work of the Lord. If we had more time, it would be good to go there. But I just want you to notice again as we just running through ed- edited highlights, if you like, of some of these repairs that are going on. But it says in verse 13, the valley gate repaired Hanum. And the inhabitants of Zenoa, they built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof, and a thousand cubits on the wall unto the dung gate. A thousand cubits. Now, a cubit, I'm sorry, I I just never learned centimeters. So a cubit's about 18 inches. (laughs) So a thousand cubits, it's a lengthy stretch of wall, that these people did. And, and isn't it amazing? There's some people that just have an amazing capacity for work. We thank the Lord for people like that, right? They're just, they're just real workers. Like we, everybody has to work, but there's some people that their energy for work outstrips others, and they've just got this incredible capacity. And here are these, uh, a thousand cubits on the wall. Amazing uh, progress that's been made uh, by this particular group. Look at down at verse 14, the dung gate. That's where all the garbage is taken out of the city, right at the bottom uh, end of the of the city. And uh, can you imagine? You you know, it's like uh, where where do you work? Uh, Well, I actually work at the garbage dump, the the dung gate. It's not exactly the most uh, I don't know. You say uh, glamorous place, and yet here are people laboring at the dung gate. Of course, it's essential. You've got to get the dirt out of the city. And it says, the dung gate repaired Malchiah, the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of Beth Hakarem. Isn't that interesting? He's a ruler. <laughs> Again, he could say, listen, that, that's beneath my dignity. I don't do dirty work like that. But here he is. That's what he's doing. And, and again, to his eternal credit, he, he's taking the, the place of the where the refuge was taken out of the town to the Hinnom Valley where it would be burned. And again, who would volunteer to such, for such a lowly place to work on as this? Well, a ruler of Beth Hakaram volunteered and he finished the job. He did that work. Uh, he says uh, he built it, set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. Notice again verse 20, and again, I wish we could go through each verse because each one has something to say to us, but it says in verse 20, after him, Baruch the son of Zabai uh, earnestly, earnestly repaired the other piece from the turning of the wall onto the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. Now, interesting how somehow it's pointed out to us that although everybody was working, something about this individual marks him out as different. It says he earnestly built it. Isn't it wonderful when people are earnest about the work of God? There's that seriousness about them. They're, 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 they're eager. They're, we might say the word zeal. They have a zealousness about them. And it's, we should never pour, as it were, scorn or cold water on somebody that has zeal. Uh, thank God, especially if it's zeal accompanied by knowledge. It's a wonderful thing. We want people that have zeal. The idea is hot. People get hot about all kinds of things in our society. Can we not get hot about the things of God? And when you see somebody that has a zeal for God, never discourage that. It's wonderful to see a zeal. Uh, I'm working with a young man right now. He's, he's just got married. He's about 20 years of age. I don't think I've ever met anybody with such a hunger to understand the Word of God as this young man. And he's plaguing me all the time, calling up, uh, what about this verse? What about this? And I just love his zeal. And, and my prayer is, Lord, may it never diminish. It's tremendous to see that. And so uh, earnestness, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And here's this man, he's earnestly or zealously repaired the section of wall assigned to him. Uh, Baruch means blessed. And it's always a blessing to have people who are noted for zeal and enthusiasm. 
And so uh, that kind of uh, runs us down uh, some of the gates. Just some principles that we can take from this before we're going to take another look at the gates from a completely different angle. But what we would say is this, kind of in in summary principles, uh, we have a wonderful example in chapter 3 of what can be accomplished if God's people work together. 52 days, what seemed like an impossible task is completed. And so what could be more accomplished in our assemblies if we would just work together for the same goal and the same cause and everybody would take their role and their part and we'd all get together and, and, and it, would, it would be incredible to see a work like that, wouldn't it, where everybody is functioning and doing their part. It was done in an orderly matter, uh, manner, an, an organized fashion. Everything's done decently and in order. Everybody knows what their part is. Everybody knows where they're supposed to be. Uh, they're all there. They're, they're all working together for the same cause. Holding back, sitting in the stands, being a pew filler, is considered to be shameful. And a careful record is kept on high. The Lord remembers and honors those who serve him. I said there's, a, there's a, um, an example here of restoration. And I want to just highlight this just for a minute in verse 31. It says, After him repaired Malchiah, the goldsmith's son, unto the place of the Nethanims and of the merchants over against the gate Mifkad and to the going up of the corner. Well, this guy, Malchiah, in verse 31, we also find him back in Ezra, chapter 10, and verse 31. In Ezra, tap, chapter 10, there's a list. And it's not a, it's not a good list. It's, one, it's a negative list. It's a list of all those that married foreign wives and Ezra had to basically tell them to separate from their foreign wives because they would lead them astray to worship the gods uh, that they uh, worshipped uh, from the, the various nations and, and of course they agreed to do it. They agreed to put away their wives uh, and put away their children. Now again, don't get any ideas, different dispensation. Uh, we're not going into that topic right now but look at verse 31. And the sons of Harim, Eliezer, Isaiah, Malchiah. Many believe this is the same individual. Same individual had earned reproach by marrying a foreign wife 13 years earlier. That's when Ezra's doing his work. 13 years have passed, and now here's the same man, and he's now restored, and he's building the wall. Isn't that tremendous? To see people who have been out of things, they've been out of the picture, maybe because of their own choices, maybe because they got sour, I don't know, whatever reason, but 13 years has elapsed and he's not been in building, he's not been involved, and now all of a sudden we see him back, restored in building. And what we could say is this, We, we can't do anything about the past except repent, turn away from past failures, and just rejoice in the fact that today is the first day of the rest of my life. And I'm, uh, some of you may be thinking, well, maybe I've been more of a shirker than a worker. I don't know. I don't know your situation. The, the nice thing about not knowing is nobody can say, oh, well, he's getting at me because I have no idea where you stand. But if the Lord has been speaking to you, I just want to tell you, you don't have to stay that way. The whole point of a week like this is this could be a life-changing week for you. You could determine, you know, I haven't been good. I haven't done what I should have done. I have, I've failed miserably. But by the grace of God, from now on, I'm going all out for the Lord Jesus. I'm going to live for Him because He's worthy, right? And, and so if, if I'm speaking to you, uh, well, you know who you are. Praise God for that. Just move on. Let's go. Let's build together. 
Notice also God's work begins first at home. Notice uh, just a, a comment that we'll notice around here uh, as we go through these verses. Uh, we notice, for instance, verse 10, Next unto him repaired uh, Jedediah the son of Harumph, even over against his house. Uh, verse uh, 23, After him repaired Benjamin and Hashub over against their house. Uh, verse 29, after him repaired Zadok, the son of Immer, over against his house. Uh, down in verse 30, at the end, it says, after him repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, over against his chamber. And so you begin to see a pattern here that wherever Nehemiah could do it, what he did was he got somebody to build the wall right in front of his house. Now that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? First of all, your commute time is cut down immeasurably. Right? If, if you're building right next to your house, it doesn't take you long to get to work. You're right there. That's common sense, isn't it? But do you think, because these walls were meant to defend the city, you think the guy who's building the wall in front of his house will do a good job? Yeah, his family's security depends on it, doesn't it? So he's going to build, and he's going to do it to, with all his might, because the <laughs> last thing he wants is the enemy coming in, breaching the wall right where his house is. And we could say this, that in assembly life, strong families make strong assemblies. And, and in a sense, the, the home is a vital part of the work of God, isn't it? Uh, if, if we want to build for God, often people come up and they'll say, oh, I, you know, Mike, I, I think I've got the gift of teaching, but I never get in any opportunity. And they've got five or eight kids. And I said, what do you mean you don't have any opportunity? You've got a ready-made congregation. Start where you are, and the Lord will open other doors for you. If, you, if you're faithful where, where, you know, where the Lord puts you, bloom where you're planted, he'll give you other opportunities. But start right there. Teach your children. Pour the word of God into their lives. That's a good place to begin, isn't it? And, and so... Uh, again, just these general principles, they're absolutely marvelous that we can draw from this. Uh, I want us to move on now, and uh, we want to look uh, again at Jerusalem's gates. Now, this is uh, a, a, a fascinating study, at least to me, because what I've observed is that in the book of uh, Nehemiah and his list of Jerusalem's gates, we find that in chapter 3, there are only 10 gates mentioned. What about in the New Jerusalem? Do you remember how many gates there were? It's 12. 12 is a number, a perfect administration. And so there's 12 gates in the eternal Jerusalem. Actually, there's 12 gates in Nehemiah's wall as well. But in chapter 3, he only ever mentions 10. Now, the other two are going to be mentioned. We'll get to that, Lord willing, before we finish today. There are, there are 12 gates, but only 10 of them are mentioned in this chapter. Now, why is 10 only mentioned? Well, we might say that this. Oftentimes, the number 10 is the number of, of, of human responsibility and human failure. For instance, 10 commandments. Human responsibility, right? For the, for the Jews that put themselves under that, that was there. They committed to keeping that. How well did they do? <laughs> Not very well, right? Human responsibility, human failure. And we, we see human failure in the 10 tribes. We see human failure in the 10 spies. And so it's just interesting that 10 is often connected with uh, responsibility and failure. So w these 10, I want to suggest to you that these 10 gates are, and we're, we're talking typology now. And what we're saying is that these 10 gates give us a, a delightful picture of the Christian life. And we want to follow them in just as uh, the book does, really. It, it starts at the top in the north, and um, uh, we're going to go anti-clockwise and we're going to follow the gates all the way from the sheep gate all the way back to the sheep gate uh, in an, an anti-clockwise 
direction because that's the way it takes us through the chapter. And so the first one that's mentioned is the sheep gate in verse 1. And of course, um, when we think of the Christian life, what was it that came through the sheep gate? Well, we already mentioned this yesterday. This is why the high priest and the priests are, are, are particularly interested in the sheep gate because it's of great importance to them because that's where the animals for sacrifice came through, right? And, of course, as we think of the Christian life, where does it all begin? Well, it all begins when we see, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Is that where we begin? The Christian life begins with a, with a glimpse of Christ as the Lamb of God who took away my sin on Calvary's cross. It begins at the gospel. It begins with salvation by the blood of the Lamb. And so, of course, we think of the Lord Jesus. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. It's interesting that this sheep gate, there was a, an amazing miracle took place in the gospel by the sheep gate. It was the, the pool of Bethesda, known as the house of mercy. And of course, a great act of mercy took place at the pool of Bethesda. Remember, uh, there's this, often I, I love preaching on that chapter because, it, do, do you remember they used to have these cameras that would take a panoramic picture. This is before the days that iPhones made cameras redundant. Remember, you used to be able to get, take these panoramic views. You often would see one, for instance, of Jerusalem. Uh, you've seen people have pictures of the panoramic view. Well, if you look at that pool of Bethesda and you, you look at it through a panoramic view, what do you see there? You, you see a, a broken humanity, the blind the lame, the halt, right? It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a graphic picture of the devastation that Adam's sin has brought into this world. And of course, there was one man there, remember? And, and every time the water moves, uh, he's trying to get in. 38 years of frustration. And then finally, the Lord Jesus comes through that gate, the Lamb of God. And he makes that man whole again. And what we could say is this, that the sheep gate is where the Lamb of God makes broken humanity well again through the gospel. And isn't it wonderful, by the way, that he makes us whole? He, he, his, his work is marvelous. And so what we could say is that, that this, um, this is where the Christian life begins. I see myself as part of that broken humanity. I see myself as a helpless sinner. I, I don't know how to walk straight. I'm lame. I can't see straight. I, I'm blind. And then, and then I'm paralyzed. I can't seem to do anything to save myself. And then the Lord Jesus comes by and I see the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world and I'm gloriously saved and I can suddenly walk. The way God intended me to. I can certainly see the way God intended me to see. And I'm no longer paralyzed. Oh, what a, what a change comes into your life when you trust in the Lamb of God. And so that's how the Christian life begins. But it doesn't end there because it says in verse 3, the next gate is the fish gate. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassanah build. You see, when God saved us, there was a purpose. He says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So the next part of the Christian life is that once you've trusted the, the Lamb of God yourself, well, one of the things you want to do is confess Christ publicly and openly and tell others about Him, the one who so marvelously changed your life. And in the process, we become fishers of men. And we seek to win souls for the Lord Jesus. And so, um, Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, 16 and 17. I'll just read it. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishers. Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. 
The disciples responded immediately to the command, and during their lifetime, they were used to bring the gospel to many. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, Peter got a great catch of fish, didn't he? Can you imagine 3,000 souls in one sermon? Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to preach a sermon like that, wouldn't you? You'd have, you'd have to pull us off the ceiling. I mean, we'd be so excited at 3,000. Like, I'm excited when one soul gets saved, but 3,000? That is amazing. And so they were fishermen. They were fishers of men. Mr. Ironside said, it's, Is it not a shame, a crying shame, that it could ever be true of saints going to heaven that they're unconcerned about sinners going to hell. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Is it not a shame, a crying shame, that it could ever be true of saints going to heaven that they are unconcerned about sinners going to hell? And there's a great need today to recover that for which the fish gate speaks. Local assemblies will cease to exist if we cease to be fishers of men. We need to be fishers of men. And then if you notice the next gate, it's down in verse 6. And it's the old gate. Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Paseer, and Meshulam, and so on and so forth. And so one thing we have to learn is that we, we need to follow the old path. One of my favorite verses is John uh, Jeremiah 6.16. And let's just turn there for a minute and, and keep your... Uh, your finger there. I'm sure you've heard much ministry on this, but it is a very interesting verse and very challenging verse, especially, I would say, in the day we find ourselves in because the nation of Judah were faced with a choice. He says, Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways. Or we might say it this way, stand at the crossroads and see and ask for the old paths where is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, how tragic these words are, we will not walk therein. Crossroad decision. Are you going to follow the old paths? Where are the good ways? Or are you going to go with the, the contemporary flavor of the month Christianity which, which leads, in a sense, I see in evangelicalism as a whole. And again, I've got many dear friends. I love them dearly. But there's a perpetual restlessness in evangelical Christianity. Always the latest fad, the latest craze, the latest bestseller, uh, the latest thing. And in my lifetime, I've seen quite a few of them. Do you remember the angels? Do you remember that about keeping a place in your car? For an angel, you know, I mean, there's just crazy things that are going on out there generally. And, and what we can say is that it, it doesn't lead to rest. But the, 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 the way God has revealed things in his word, there's a simple way of following him. What we call the old paths, they're, they're, they're pretty simple and they're joyful. The beauty of God's design. All wise God has made his own will known in his word. And the best possible way to go on as a Christian is simply follow what God has said in his word. Can't approve it. You can't. It's just right there. It's beautiful. And so we move on to the next gate. And I think this is very appropriate. This gate comes next. Because let's say we do follow the old paths. You know, one of the greatest dangers of following the old paths is you can become filled with spiritual pride that we're following the old paths. So what's the next gate? Verse 13, the valley gate. Interesting. See, what, a valley is a low place, isn't it? And the idea is this, that what, w w to whatever degree of light we attain, we must always walk in humility. Because if we don't, if we get... If we get lifted up with pride, the Word of God is clear. God resists the proud. We, even for all our rightness, God says, no, I'm not going to work with you because you, you stink. You're so full of pride. And uh, so much problems. Only by pride comes contention. 
God resists, you know, God resists the proud. You know that word resist, it means he sets himself in opposition against the proud. You know what it says? He gives grace to the humble. Isn't that beautiful? And so, whatever degree of light we come to, and maybe we feel like we're really walking in the old paths, but if we get lifted up with pride, we've lost the plot. We're following the one who humbled himself, right? Humbled himself to death, even the death of the cross. And so, oh, Lord, ever keep us. My my prayer daily is, Lord, ever keep me small in my own eyes and keep you large in my eyes. That's just got to watch it. It's so subtle. And it comes in different ways. Pride of place, pride of race, pride of grace. We could go on and on. But whatever way it comes, it's the satanic sin. We're never more like Satan when we're lifted up with pride. We're never more like the Lord Jesus when we walk in humility. So we must learn about the valley gate. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And so we must walk humbly before our God. We must walk. You know, it's a wonderful thing, though, too, as we walk through the valley gate. We're also reminded that the Christian life is not all mountaintop experiences. There's also times when we walk through the valley, isn't there? Unless you're a person that's always had mountaintop experiences. But I would suggest to you that often we learn more in the valleys than we do on the mountaintops. And the wonderful thing about the valley is that eventually we're going to go through the last valley. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And you know what? Death affects everybody. One in one dies. Every human being, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, dies. It's the, it's, the, it's the ultimate statistic, isn't it? And yet, so unsaved die of cancer, and so, so do saved people. What's the difference? The difference is this. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. As a believer, we're never alone. And people say, well, it's just a crutch to, to lean on. Well, it's good to admit that I can't stand myself. I need a crutch to lean on. Uh, I'm really glad I realized I need a crutch, don't you? I can't do this myself. I need the Lord. And, and even, especially in the trials of life, I need to know He's there and He's promised I'm with you. And one of the things about the Lord is that He can take us through a valley of weeping and He can make it into a blessing. So often when we've gone through valleys, we find that in terms of ministering to people, when you've been through something and you come to somebody else who's going through something, there's there's a great degree of empathy when you can say, I know what it's like. I've been there. You can really identify. It, It can turn into a great blessing. The things the Lord has taken us through. And so, as well as the valley gate, of course, we move on to the next gate. It's called the Dung Gate. We've already talked about it, that in the Christian life, one of the things that we have to constantly be doing is removing rubbish from our lives. Because if rubbish is allowed to build up, it stinks. You need to constantly get the rubbish out, don't we? And so we can think of that in terms of sanctification, that as we get saved and cause the, the gospel is life-changing. But pretty soon after we've been saved a while, we realize that there's, the, the old man is still wanting to exert his influence on our lives, right? And, and there's a conflict going on between the flesh and the spirit, and it will continue until the rapture of the church. I remember as a young believer asking an old man, He'd been saved for many years, and I said to him, I said, brother, does it get any easier? And I was desperate for him to say, oh, 
it, it's like a cakewalk. You know, you've been saved a few years. You don't have any problems. It's just easy. Well, he said, Mike, it seems the longer I walk with the Lord, the harder it gets. I didn't want to hear that. But you see that persistence of the need to remove dung from our lives. To remove that which is dirty. To, uh, even in assembly life, put away from you that wicked person. Of course, that's always the last resort. We should not be quick to do that. We should have tried many, many things before we ever get to that stage. But uh, the last resort, put away from you that wicked person. So in assembly life, there needs to be a, it, it, has, to, it has to be, God wants, let me put it this way, God delights to use clean vessels. And we've talked about this here before, but the Holy Spirit, He wants to work through us, out through us, manifesting Christ to a lost world. But if we are harboring dirt in our lives, all the Spirit's energy goes inwardly to convict us of that which we need to deal with that is hindering communion with the Lord. And so... The dung gate is very important. Removing the rubbish from our lives. Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. And you know what I found over the years is that the place where dirt comes in is the mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Another person put it this way. You're not what you think you are. Because we always tend to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. You're not what you think you are, but what you think you are. That interesting. And so that's why the high priest, on his bonnet, on his headdress, across the front of the headdress was a gold plate, and written on it said this, Holiness unto the Lord. And isn't it appropriate that it's right there, in a sense, right connected to his forehead? And what we would say is this, that God is saying if we want to live a holy life, it begins with a holy thought life. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are of good report, think on these things. And so we have to make sure that if we don't want to have to constantly deal with dirt in our lives that we have pure minds. <laughs> That's a great place to begin, isn't it? To have the mind that is pure. Well, we got five minutes and we got a bunch of gates. So let's look at verse 15. It says, but the gate of the fountain. When we think of the fountain, uh, we think of the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's often symbolized in terms of water, right? The, the woman of Samaria uh, welling up within her would be water. Uh, the, John 7, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit. And so it's speaking of the Spirit, of course. Uh, I, I think when we come to the place where we realize as believers what wretched men we are, Romans chapter 7. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then we get into chapter 8 of Romans, and it's the Pentecost of Romans. The Holy Spirit's mentioned over and over and over again. And so the idea is this, that w when we realize the battle we have, we come to the place where we realize, I can't do this myself. I, I need divine energy to live this life. I can't live it in my own strength anymore. I need the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it's a vital place in your spiritual experience when you come to the end of yourself and you come to that place where you say, I have to depend on that indwelling heavenly guest to manifest Christ's life through me. I can't do it myself. Oh, what a place to get. And so we need to discover the fountain gate. The fountain gate so we can live that life which is pleasing to our blessed Savior. And it's interesting that you have cleansing the dung gate before filling the fountain gate. Remember that great old hymn? Emptied 
that thou shouldest fill me a clean vessel in thy hands. All right, so we've got to dirt out, spirit coming to control, to empower, to invigorate. And then as we move on from there, the gate of the fountain, the next one we see is verse 26. Moreover, the Nethanims dwelt in Ophel on the place over against the water gate toward the east to the, and the tower that lieth out. So the water gate. So if you like, we could say this living water speaks of the spirit. Still water speaks of the word of God. Okay. The washing of water by the word. Okay. So that's, that's the picture that's conveyed to us. Uh, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And of course, the fact that they're both connected with water is because in some ways, the spirit and the word are so interconnected because the word, well, is inspired by the spirit, right? The, the, as it were, the still water is affected by the fountain, uh, by the, uh, the living water, as it were, of the uh, spirit. And so the washing of water by the word. And of course, very important. Interesting, when we get to chapter 8, still optimistic, that the revival takes place at the water gate. And at the water gate, Ezra opens the book of the law, and the book of the law is expounded, and the revival occurs. Isn't that interesting? Why at the water gate? Why not at some other gate? Well, because the water gate is connected with the word of God. And then uh, verse 28, the horse gate, uh, it says uh, from, from above the horse gate, of course the horse gate was where the military rode forth into battle. And it pictures spiritual warfare. And we recognize that after we've been saved a while, we realize we're in a spiritual battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this present age. And so we're in a battle. And so uh, we have to learn about the horse gate. We have to, we have to recognize that we're soldiers. We're, we're fighting the good fight. We're enduring hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We have armor to put on. It's all about a battle. We're in a battle. And, and I want to tell you, it's a, it's a very real battle with a real enemies that would like to put us out of the race. And so we need to recognize how to fight in the war. And, of course, it's in dependence on the Lord. And so we've got there. And then the next gate is the east gate. I wish we had more time. In fact, <coughs> let me just tell you what they are, and then we'll expound them more fuller tomorrow night. The east gate is very significant because <coughs> when you look at the book of Ezekiel, when the glory of the Lord left the temple in Ezekiel, it went out of the east gate. It went from the temple to the east gate. From the east gate, it went up to the Mount of Olives, and then it departed from Israel. When the Lord Jesus went out of the city, he went out of the east gate to the Mount of Olives, and he ascended to glory. When he comes back, Ezekiel 43, the glory of the Lord comes back to the mount towards the east. From there, it comes down into the east gate and into the city. A lot more to say about that. The Muslims have bricked up the east gate and built a cemetery in front of it. Think they know something? I think they know something. They, they don't, the last thing they want, they know Messiah is coming, they know he's going to go through that gate. They don't want him to. Kind of interesting. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. And then the Mifgad gate, verse 31, is basically the inspection gate. And, of course... We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And then we go back to the sheep gate in verse 32. So the Christian life, after the Lord comes, and then we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, then we find ourselves in glory. And in glory, once again, we find ourselves where we started. You see, our whole journey began when we saw the Lamb. And when we get to glory, what are we going to be seeing? Oh, yeah, a Lamb, as it had been slain. See, we'll never get away, in a sense, and nor should we. 
from our preoccupation with God's precious Lamb. That's going to be our eternal object. So that's the Christian life. Now, tomorrow, Lord willing, we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on those last few gates. And then we'll look at the two missing gates and ask the question, if there were 12, why does he only mention 10? And we're going to find out what those other two gates are and their significance. And then, Lord willing, we'll go into chapter 4 and we'll look at the conflict. Because <clears throat> we said we're in a war. And if anybody knew that he was involved in spiritual warfare, it's Nehemiah. In chapter 4, there's a lot of battles.